everybody. Um, all right, so today we are, or this week, we are talking about um, the art and art and the internet and digital art and appropriation and kind of all the stuff that goes with that. Um, you know, we can't really talk about contemporary art and like where art is right now without talking about the fact that like, you know, we live in the internet age or we will talk the post internet age. Um, so, it's not just that art is affected by the art that is being created today is being affected by the stuff like that's happening in the world, but it's also about what's happening in the internet and there's art that's being created on the internet because the internet is like this whole other like virtual world. Obviously, y'all should know that by now. Um, y'all pretty much like only lived within a time of the internet. So yeah, it's pretty interesting to think about. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so what we have up here is um, for the image on the background, um, which y'all can see on the slideshow if you download it, um, is Occupy the Internet by FAT. Um, FAT is a free art and technology lab organization dedicated to enriching the public domain through research and development through cre creative technologies. So if y'all have heard of like, um, they... It's basically an activist group that wants to make sure that technology and like creative technology is free because especially considering that like artists don't have um generally speaking a lot of money like a lot of artists don't make a lot of money there that there's a reason for the whole like starving artist trope and art supplies are not cheap photoshop is not cheap like literally like a subscription you have to like you don't just pay for it once you gotta keep paying um so they're trying to like resource these kind of ways that artists, um, and just different resources on the internet that, like, are digital, and they're trying to make them free for everybody. Um, and so this Occupy the Internet project, that was here as part of that project, um, draws on the kitsch, folksy, iconology, whatever, of, um, the GIF images, um, the standard format for animated images on the internet um it is a web extension of Wa occupy wall street uh y'all probably like in middle school i don't know whenever occupy wall street was happening but whatever occupy wall street was happening i was in college um so this is like an online version of that and that was um shortly after the uh the crash of 2008 like you know 2010 kind of really really started because like all the banks got bailed out and all like and all of these like big execs um so people were like the you know the whole 99 percent that thing started at um the occupy wall street um yeah so the peaceful movement that began in the Zuccotti Park. So Occupy Wall Street peaceful movement that began in Zuccotti Park in 2011 to protest abuses of financial capitalism and itself was inspired by the Arab Spring and Indigenados movement in Spain. So it was just about like a capitalism and stuff like that. I mean, people were doing um, that even here in Athens. People were like sitting by the arch, um, like camping out. And yeah, so Occupy the Internet. Because, you know, the Internet's a different world, Wall Street. All right, next one. So, internet art, also known as net art. So, um, you'll hear it different ways. Internet art, net art. Net art was more specifically what was being made in the early 90s, uh, or like maybe 90s, 2000s era. But um, now people don't really call like the internet the net. And um, the internet in general is like much more multifaceted. So, you know, it's kind of just like that was more of that one movement and then overall we are in internet art right now also. So the term is, so net art as a term is used to describe the process of art making um, using a computer in some form of, or other, whether to download imagery um, that is exhibited online or to build programs that create the artwork. The internet as a medium for production, public Okay, so the so in internet art, this means that um, the internet is a means of production. It is a means of publication, uh, distribution, promotion, dialogue, consumption, and critique. So it's in a regular art, like or in you know traditional non-digital art forms, 
you know, you're the you're making it in person. You're making it, and then the publication of it might happen in a magazine. All of these are happening in different er areas. The distribution of it might happen. It could happen online distribution, but it could also, if you're making like a physical object, like it could happen in a store or something, you know, a gallery, the promotion of it, you know, that might, it depends for everything. But here in the internet art, it's all happening online. The dialogue about the art. So you're not necessarily, internet art is not meant to be like about dialogue that you're having, although you can like, you know, um, like in person, but a lot of times the work of the internet art does happen online. The, the dialogue of it happens online. You consume it online, obviously, because it exists online. And you can critique, critique it online. That's how that works. Um, so, I mean, unless you want to print it out or like if you're talking about it with a friend, but for the most part, this is all happening digitally. So with this internet art also comes the disintegration of um, and a mutation of the artist. So the artist is no longer just the maker of the thing. The artist also becomes the curator. They become the pen pal. The, they are writing. Um, they, they are the audience. Because at the same time that they're creating this work on the internet, they are also, as internet users, consuming the work. Um, they also become the gallery, the theorist, the art collector, and the museum. So an internet... Like if you have a portfolio online, that's your own like little gallery or museum. Um, so it's kind of cool, like internet art. So net art is a self-defining term. Let me see if there's anything else I want to add. Okay, so this pretty much gives y'all like a general idea of internet art. Like it can be used as a medium that you find inspiration on and you create with. Um, things that you have pulled off of the internet, but also you can create web pages. And we'll talk about this all in, as we go further. Here um, we have Emmanuel Laflame. And um, he, this is a work called Jesus Saves. If y'all don't get it, this is like a classical image of Jesus. And this is a, like the saving thing on the computer, like whenever you're saving a document. I thought it was funny because, well, obviously, saving papers is very important to do. Um, so, I've lost several, like, little tidbits of stuff from not saving properly, so always remember to do that. And, it, yeah, so this is internet art. This is what, what he's doing here is he's creating a mashup. Um, so, Emmanuel Laflame uh, recycles popular imagery with humor, creating scenes with strong meaning. That lead us to smile and think. Like Surrealist, he develops representations with an apparent impossibility that captures the viewer's attention. He creates his works like a creative director who, ha who, ha who has nothing to sell. Combining cultural references, he diverts ancient and modern myths to serve us his perspective of the world, at once a tender and critical. The absurd is his playground, and the anachronism is his specialty. Emmanuel was born in 1984 in Montreal, a self-taught artist. He works as a designer in an, on an animated series and is involved with advertising, movie, and gaming industries. So he's like very much in the whole digital, net, internet kind of art world. Obviously, this was inspired by stuff that he pulled off of the internet and it exists on the internet. Um, so yeah, I have his like website on the notes if you want to look at it. Um, so next, another type of art form, or one type, so there are sub-genres of internet art. Um, read about it on, there's a Tate thing that y'all can read about it on there, so. It's on the calendar, art terms, internet art terms. But this is also where this is from. So, um, browser art is, um, a renegade artwork made as a part of a URL that uses the computer as a raw material, transforming the codes, the structure of the website, and it links between servers into visual material. Um, so here we have browser art, you know, it, it, like it says, it's whenever it takes the URL and it makes a new like art out of the browser. So it might switch up something that you'll see here. Um, 
between the server and the viewer or perhaps it is itself its own URL that is um, only there for artistic reasons like you click on it it's just like it's this was more of a thing I think especially in uh, the early times of the internet as you'll read in one of the articles from hyper allergic on the calendar but um you know that they, they had like welcome pages on their internet like artists would internet artists would but here's some contemporary or even more contemporary because internet art is all technically contemporary for the most part but here's a more contemporary version of browser art and this is by american artist um and this is called looted so this is on the website of the whitney museum the whitney is um an american art museum in new york city and it is very very famous and um so they are currently are running this series and they've had other artists but right now it is american artists so this is called sunrise sunset and it's a series of internet art projects that mark sunrise and Sunset and Sunrise in New York City every day. All of the works are commissioned by Whitney specifically for Whitney.org, each project unfolding a, over a time frame of 10 to 30 seconds. Using Whitney.org as their habitat, sun, Sunrise Sunset projects disrupt place or engage with the museum website as information environment. This form of engagement captured the core artistic practice on the internet, the intervention in existing online spaces. The series is organized by Christine Poma, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so y'all get the general idea of this sunrise sunset. So what happens, um, what happens here, this is called Looted by, sorry, this is called Looted by American Artist, and um, that's the artist's name, American Artist. Um, and Looted temporarily places all of the images in Whitney.org with textures of plywood, while the background of the pages changes to the, to the black text on them fades. The artwork symbolically and literally boards up the museum and its website in act of both redaction and refusal. So, at both, currently, right now, if you go to the new website, at sunrise and sunset, then you will come across this on their collection page. Typically on the collection page, you see what you see on an online you know, whatever, every other museum clutch page, which is pictures of actual art. But obviously if y'all are watching the news and you're seeing things about like the business being looted, people are like putting ply boards up over the windows because they've been looted or they're worried about them being looted. Um, so here he is taking that idea of looting and, and like putting it here in the museum, not only to bring a thought about Black Lives Matter, but also think about the fact that a lot of the works within a museum were actually looted like why do you think that like the british museum of art has w works from all over the world because they're col colonists and they took it like i mean th they looted the met is full of looted items but you know this is what american artists was talking about so here, looting is defined as stealing goods from a place, typically during a war or riot, has again become a flashpoint for discussion. Um, through its crucial and not complete looting with protests, some did occur in the shadow of the important and necessary recent protests in the U.S. cities, denouncing racial injustice and police brutality. While the property damage and theft were almost universally denounced, these acts of vandalism were also viewed by some as expressions of long-simmering frustrations and the demonstrations against symbols seen as perpetuating state violence, systemic racism, and capitalist exploitation. <clears throat> so American artists extends the physicality of the tension between the protests and looting to the online space, the primary site for the viewing of art, culture, and programming during the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's one. That's one. So it's not only about the art, but Clearly, he also is extending it to the thought about looting within the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, so about American artists, American artists, he was born in 1989. He is an interdisciplinary artist whose work considers black labor, visibility, as well as anti-blackness within networked life and digital systems. Their work includes video installation, new media, and writing. And their legal name change to American artists serves as an ambient foundation for their practice. It insists on blackness as a descriptive of an American artist and at the 
same time erases the identity of the in the virtual spaces where American artists is an anonymous name, unable to be Googled or validated by a computer or as a person's name. So here, like, I mean, he doubly plays with the internet, not only like with his art, obviously, but with his name, because as he said, he subverts himself where he's ultimately anonymous online because you can look up the word American artist and it's almost impossible to Google. So, pretty cool. Next. All right, another form of art is software art or another form of internet art, sorry. Another um, subgenre of internet art is software art. And software art is a work of art where the creation of software, where or concepts from software play an important role. Um, for example, software applications were created by artists in which were intended to be artworks, used as artworks for work. There's all different forms of like software art and there's like debates about like what art is software or what software is art and what is not. So, I mean, I'm not really gonna get fully into that because I don't understand anything about software and this has a lot to do with like building and coding and things like that that I also don't know a lot about. Um, but if you wanna get into software art, there are websites and I, um, you know, just look at it. Um, but what I will say, there are very cool versions or like cool applications of software art and contemporary art. And um, one of them is here at the, and it was at the Copper Hewitt Smithsonian, Smithsonian Design Museum. So um, this was by a group called Local Projects headed by Jake Barton. Um, and he, this artist has this, you know, see this, uh, what is it like? It's like a table, but like a computer table. I don't really know what you would call that. And then there's this special pin that you'll see at like the bottom here. And so he designed the pin and this room. So it's software of the pin and like software of the table. Um, and then you can, you know, incorporate your own designs as you see there and make your own designs. And yeah, and then it gets like duplicated and it shows you how to design it. It's at a museum and it's like a very immersive design exhibit software art so yeah he created the software to make this art happen and to make this design experience immersive all right so telematic art so telematic art was coined by british artist and theorist roy ascot in the early 1990s to describe interactive art that uses the internet and other digital means of communication like email and mobile phones um so this is a project here by Miranda July and it's called We Think Alone and it was done in 2013 and it took place entirely on the internet. Um, and so We Think Alone was um, 20 emails over 20 weeks uh, and it was a collaboration between um, like a bunch of people that she's friends with that are famous and, or they're artists and writers and different things and um each week had like a theme and like they would the people would that were participating would send an email out to this random user list that was just like the first week was like an email about money and it was just like a general boring dumb email about money like email that gives advice an email that mentions Barack Obama so they're just like going through their archives these different people on different days sending out emails and this is like a thing that exists online um so here's a quote from Miranda July. She says, I'm always trying to get my friends to forward me emails they've sent other people. To their mom, to their boyfriend, their agent, the more mundane the better. How they comport themselves in an email is so innate, almost obscene, a glimpse of them from their own point of view. We Think Alone has given me the excuse to read my friends' emails, the emails of some people I wish I was friends with, and for better or worse, it's changed the way I see all of them. I think I really know them now. But our inner life is not actually the same as our life on the inner, on the computer. A quiet person might, a lot. A person with a busy mind might write almost nothing. And of course, while none of the emails were originally intended to be read by me, much less you, they were all carefully selected by their authors in response to my list of email genres. So self-portraiture is quietly at work here. Privacy, the art of it is evolving. Privacy and the art of it is evolving. Radical self-exposure and classically manicured discretion can both be powerful and both elegant. The email itself is changing and none of us use it exactly the same way. Not to use it at all. Thank you, 
like the people. So basically she's talking, she's kind of breaking down the walls and the, the barriers of like privacy and like what is privacy? Um, because you know, with the internet, what, you never know what's going to stay private, like what's not, like, I mean, you hope that stuff stays private, but stuff happens. And then sometimes the air exists. So our project. So we think alone, obviously it's like thoughts that you have about the internet and this is, and then it's broadcasted up to everybody. Thematic art. Um, and yeah, so all of this, so these things, ultimately they, what this comes down to, what internet art is, because in what digital art, what the problem with digital art, one of the problems with digital art, is it's very ephemeral. So if you don't, you maybe have heard that word a lot, like in the last, uh, like, uh, week in this. But, so ephemeral, if you aren't sure what it, what, what it means, so it's ephemeral is used to describe objects found in nature, although it can describe a wide range of things, including human artifacts, intentionally made to last for only a temporary period in order to increase their perceived aesthetic value. Um, so it's not necessarily that like digital art's always meant to last for a short period, but we have to think about how fast is technology changing? Stuff becomes obsolete so quickly that it, and it can get lost easily. And if you don't have the materials to transfer it over to the files that currently exist, then it's easy for stuff to get lost, um, especially in the vastness of the internet and everything that's being created today. But here's an example of like the, how even like the material things of the internet have like become obsolete too. So um, this is, uh, this right here is um, thing. It was designed to emulate the functionality of bulletin board systems. So this was actually created two years before the internet, before the first digital image was uploaded to the web. Um, and it's about art criticism and it's basically like a, it's a message board, like an early message board and on like a, like an old, very analog computer. Um, and it kind of like shows other people's messages or something like that. But now for this work to be shown and exhibited, like the process of learning to like save the artwork and like restore it is becoming like more challenging, especially, you know, as like, we don't have the stuff that if something breaks in one of these computers, they can always fix it. Um, so while there are standards for preserving more traditional art forms, such as photography, printmaking, those standards don't yet exist for digital art. Instead, individual institutions have developed their own digital art preservation programs. So the Whitney has um, its own internet art like website it's called art Court, and they are actually like saving and archiving internet art and that's very cool that they're doing that that happened that started in like 2001 but each institution has to make up their own process of how to do it and um the recreation of these art forms can be problematic because artists must decide whether they want their work to be translated into media that they don't even know exists yet um, in 20 years, websites written in HTML may no longer be available. So that's another thing to think about. So you have to think about the, how do you want your, like if you're an artist that's going to have your work collected, how do you see this working years from now? Are you going to give the museum permission to do what they need to do to make sure that it can be viewed later? Or does it die with the technology? All right, so. All of this comes down to the fact that also the internet is definitely a site for collaboration. So, um, this was, this is, um, from Moon by, uh, Ai Weiwei and Olaf, Ofo, Olfer Ellison. And, um, this was in your reading, the one by Literat. So here, what they did, um, Moon is a shared platform that invites users to leave their own mark, drawn or written on a virtual moon surface. Since it's launched um, in 2013, the lunar landscape amassed over 80,000 entries growing from a blank white canvas um, to dense collections of diverse responses. Each, individual, each contribution has created a small but distinct change into a developing landscape highlighting the importance of individual expression amongst 
collective participation, the Moon Open Call for Creative Input is a powerful statement about the potential for ideas to connect people across vast distances and break through political, social, and geographical boundaries in the internet age. So, there we go. Um, and so, this was a thing that, as you'll read about, existed entirely, it was created online because um, Ellison and Wei Wei lived in different places um, and they were unable to travel together. So it was created online, it, it was distributed online, it exists online, it was a virtual moon. So yeah, it connected to people online through online collaboration. Both artists were collaborators and the, the participants in some way are the collaborators. So online collaboration. Next. This brings me to vernacular creativity. So um, vernacular creativity is a term that can be used to, to provide a critical historicized perspective on user-led content production that takes cultural policies into account. It signifies a wide range of everyday creative practices from scrapbooking to family photography to storytelling that forms part of casual chat that have been that have a long history in the private sphere but are in an increasingly large range of contexts being rem remanded to public culture through digital technologies and platforms. So this is kind of talking about um, vernacular creativity is like our lives that exist on the internet, the, the creative output that we collectively are having, whether it's your, you know, your Instagram profile, your Facebook, your Twitter, all of this, like some digital storytelling, you know, that I know that there's plenty of digital storytelling that's happening on Twitter and Tumblr and, um, TikTok. Uh, so this is all like a vernacular creativity because we are together creating this creative content um, that prior to this would not have existed on the internet. Like this, this, some of this stuff was just stuff that would have been more in the private sphere. And so we also have, you know, the vernacular creativity that exists and it's just the sharing of your artwork, whether it's created digitally or not. Um, here's Tumblr. And here's Deviant, Deviant Art. So these are like two like, you know, share sharing art platforms, kind of like Pinterest, but people also use Instagram a lot for that. Um, so this kind of provides how, you know, things can evolve. Like once it's on the internet, you know, you own it, but then it's also the creative license. People might take it and then change something about it. The creative license becomes like a little bit uh, skewed, I guess. I don't really know. Um, how to, it's, it's complicated, I'll put it that way. Um, so yeah, vernacular creativity. Vernacular creativity, like I, like I was saying about, um, uh, you know, the authorship getting skewed and like the, I, so this brings us back to appropriation. We have talked about appropriation before, so I hope by now y'all remember it. Um, if not, the appropriation is the use of pre-existing objects or images with little or no transformation applied to them. Um, so on the internet, this can happen a lot. I mean, we'll get into that in a minute. But here, Penelope Umbrico, she is um, an artist best known for appropriating images on the internet um, from sites like Flickr and Craigslist, which she then manipulates to construct large-scale images or installations according to a minimalist aesthetic. So here, this is called Flickr Birthdays from, this is like 10 million pictures, 10 million something pictures. Um, so obviously I don't have all of them up here. Um, but yeah, so she, she like creates like wall installations that are just images of other people's birthday days that she found like specifically on Flickr. So it like, it's kind of like, is she doing the creating there, but it's appropriating other people's imagery. But the putting together and the curating of it is like the creation, but again, appropriation. Because she's not the one that is creating the individual images that she's using. Um, and obviously, another form of appropriation is memes. Um, and another form of vernacular creativity. So, memes are a form of vernacular creativity. Uh, so, I'm going to assume that y'all know what memes are because like, how would you not like what, what I don't know maybe you're Amish or something um but also like now you're on a computer so uh all right so imitations so memes are imitations of pre-existing units that are remixed 
and modify to express a range of ideas or emotions for various audiences. Um, you know, memes have been around for some extent, like for a little while, but they definitely have evolved now. And like they're, the way that people reproduce memes, you know, one image, you know, it lives forever with a meme. I'm sure that y'all have seen all of these images, especially like, what's that? Gene Wilder. Um, so he, so these are some memes that I found because I thought they were funny. So this one at the top says, so you like Jeff Koons' work, tell me about how he creates it. Um, well, you, you know, if y'all don't know, Jeff Koons, like, has a factory of people that make his artwork. Like, cool, yeah, like, you got a balloon dog, but did he ever touch it? You know, that, like, he always brags about how he doesn't actually touch any of his artworks. Um, and then, yeah, what if I told you, then the Neo from The Matrix, what if I told you it's all, per I don't know, all performance art. Well, I have some performance. Um, so collecting means a museum is preserving a digital culture and heritage for all. The Oprah meme, the you get a car. Uh, that reference is making in my dissertation. And um, a star of history doesn't know anything about contemporary artists. So these are some memes. These are memes that are like more specifically about contemporary art. Maybe you haven't seen these memes before, but I bet y'all have seen all of the images on these memes. And that's what vernacular creativity is. Um, memes epitomize contemporary culture of remix and appropriation. Here, remix is expected in contrast to professional contemporary creative products, which are behind copyright walls and fiercely protected. So memes, unlike, you know, copyright objects and stuff, like, this is just like pictures that exist on the internet. They're creative commons. They can be free and used for all. So me memes are highly dem democratized art form. The makers own the, me the means of production. The reproduction applications are endless. But a meme isn't simply an image shared along electronically. It's also a signal boost towards its own niche. While some meme templates grow to have a tremendous audience potential, they're typically born on the quieter edges of the internet. Um, so yeah, memes aren't always funny, obviously. The, there's terrible memes, there's violent memes, there's sexist memes. The Trump, the Trump people love the memes. They love the shitty memes. Um, but y'all read about that in your thing. Memes can incite nationalism and, you know, bring people together. They can also just like be funny, you know, the whole Dolly Parton meme that was blowing up the internet like a little while ago, like the Tinder, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, MySpace, I, I don't know all the swipes. Um, so memes are great. You, you understand what they are, part of online art. All right, social media as art. So I assume many of y'all are on social media or y'all know what social media is. There's many different forms. Um, you know, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, TikTok, all of the things. Um, so we talked about this girl before, Molly Soda. Molly Soda. Um, so Molly Soda is a Brooklyn-based artist, internet celebrity, and she creates YouTube videos in which she takes different personas and employs relics of bygone digital era, a testament to her own internet upbringings spent blogging on Exanga and Live Journal. Her website is a mess of dancing girl gifts and pre-related dolls, just like these weird anonymous avatars, blah, blah, blah. So here, she kind of like creates this own persona online and it kind of blurs the lines of like, um, like the internet persona and the real, per the real person and she, the social media, and she creates the performance of herself and her being is like on social media, like her, her art is her performance of self on social media. Um, so yeah. So this is called Don't Be So Sensitive. Um, and then finally, we have, po we are more or less living in the post-internet age. Um, and post-internet is not to say that like we don't use internet anymore. Um, post-internet is defined as a result of the contemporary movement, moment inherently informed by the ubiquitous authorship of the development of attention as currency, the collapse of the physical space and networked culture, and the infinite reproductibility and mutability of digital materials. Um, so yeah, it's basically how we are living in a time where you can like find anything on the internet. You can re reproduce anything on the internet. It's not that you are 
the the idea of the original in this sense gets blurred um in the post internet society because if we think about you know the original if something was originally thought of on the internet and it comes to, to being on real life like what which, which part was the inner which part was the original or here we have um jacoby satterwhites and you'll um there is a video on the thursday um calendar what what to watch section about him and he is a really cool artist he lives in new york um and so uh jacob Sat jacob Lusada white um he brings together like animation voguing um his queer bringing together such practices of voguing 3d animation and drawing satter white stream white Dreamlike videos explore his own body and queerness while also incorporating his mother's identity, her schizophrenia, and the thousands of illustrations she made throughout his childhood. Scatterwhite started as a painter, but his practice um, shifted to new media whenever he was in front of a green screen. So, um, basically what happens in his videos and what he does is he, all of this right here, you know, it looks like a lot of people in this image, and this is like a video, and it's like a digit, it's like very much like, looks like a second life kind of video, or reproduction, or like, uh, like The Sims, but these are all him, so he takes images of himself, and then he has other people, um, and other images from the internet, and then he like, films himself from like different angles to create reproductions, and like, and then he puts himself all over there. Um, and then he's dancing and he has like reproductions of himself dancing, but all of this also stems from video game culture and this, and, um, digital culture and internet culture and none of this would have like been thought of without the internet and he's using it on the internet and creating it with internet tools and stuff like that. So it is a post internet art. Um, yeah, so that this is the time that we're living in. Um, so in the post-internet climate, it is assumed that the work of art lies equally in the version of the object one would encounter at the art gallery, the images and other representations disseminated through the internet and print publication, bootleg images of the object or its representation and variations of any of these as edited and recontextualized by any other author. So here, obviously, it's kind of like, you know, if you were see this in the gallery versus on your computer ultimately if you were watching video it would not be that different of experience other than the fact that it's in the art gallery maybe the tv is bigger or something like that maybe the surround sound is bigger but the the actual object the viewing of it the thing the digital to the digital it won't be a different like a movie at the movie theater versus a movie at your house it, it's the same movie so yeah now we are living in the post-internet age and yeah, so that is all and I have for y'all today. Internet art, go make stuff. Enjoy the assignments for the week and 